Hello everybody, my name is Mohanad Sadek and today we'll be discussing cardiac arrhythmia treatments. This is the first of a three-part series lecture. We'll be discussing bradycardias and heart block, acute and chronic treatment, supraventricular tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia, acute and chronic treatment, and finally we'll discuss atrial fibrillation. Here are the objectives from the University of Ottawa School of Medicine. So why are we having this talk? You know, Arrhythmias, whether bradycardias or tachycardias, elicit a lot of anxiety due to the urgency of managing them and the instability of the patients. And uh, the patients are usually very symptomatic, whether they have very fast heart rates or very slow heart rates. And uh, the more you know, the more you understand, and the more you can break it down, the easier it becomes to manage these conditions. This is a normal rhythm ECG. This is what I strive to obtain in my practice. So whether it's a patient with low heart rate or fast heart rate, we're always trying to get them to normal so that they feel better and they, uh, they function better. And um, this is something that most of us have, but we take it for granted. First, we'll discuss bradycardias in this part of the lecture series. And like we had discussed before, bradycardias are either due to sinus node problems, such as sinus bradycardia, sinus atrial exit block, sinus pauses, or sinus arrests or due to AV node problems, mainly second degree and third degree AV block. Symptoms of bradycardias include fatigue, shortness of breath, presyncope, syncope, or death. Let's first discuss the acute treatment of bradycardia and heart block. This is a slide from the ACLS guidelines looking at uh, acute management of bradycardia. The first thing to do in any emergency situation is to assess the ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. So we always want to maintain a patent airway, make sure the patient's breathing. If they're hypoxemic, place them on oxygen, and then place them on a cardiac monitor and assess the blood pressure and an oximetry. An IV access needs to be obtained in order to, uh, in order to administer medications and get a 12-lead ECG if there's time to do so. And then we will use that information to assess the stability of the patients. Are they hypotensive? Do they have an altered mental status? Are there signs of shock? Acute heart failure? If not, if they're stable, then we have time to do an ECG, monitor, and assess the situation. If they're unstable, or they have any of those things, then the first line treatment is atropine. And the dose is present here. And if atropine is ineffective, we can try other medications such as dopamine or epinephrine, or transcutaneous pacing. Transcutaneous pacing with pacing pads is uncomfortable for patients and at times painful, so appropriate sedation needs to be given at the same time, and technical expertise to see if the pacing is working or not. Of course, if you're having to resort to these, um, to these, um, either advanced medications or pacing, expert consultation with cardiologists is important. Potentially, the need for transvenous pacing, meaning inserting a wire, um, a pacing wire from the neck or the femoral vein to try to pace the heart until a more definite solution can be applied. So this is the acute management of bradycardias. So what about the chronic treatment? If a patient comes in, they're bradycardic for whatever reason, may it be second degree or third degree AV block, and we either have them controlled on medications or we've placed a transvenous wire to pace their heart. What's the chronic treatment after that? Well, it depends whether they need to be treated or not. Um, looking at sinus node disease, sinus bradycardia in and of itself sometimes needs treatment and sometimes doesn't. It really depends on the underlying cause. For example, if a, if a person is athletic, and their sinus bradycardic at baseline with no uh, symptoms, there is no need for treatment. If a person develops sinus bradycardia at nighttime, caught on monitoring, or if they're on telemetry and you see pauses at night, that doesn't necessarily need treatment. They're asymptomatic, and if they have a normal heart rate during the day, we don't need to do, treat nighttime bradycardia. Similarly, if a person is on multiple medications that would cause bradycardia, for example, like calcium channel blockers used to treat hypertension, or beta blockers. We don't necessarily need to do anything except reduce the doses of these medications. So you don't always have to pursue more invasive management for sinus bradycardia. 
Regarding sinoatrial exit, exit block or pauses, most of the time that does need treatment, and especially if symptomatic. With respect to AV nodal disease, first degree AV block doesn't need treatment. As we had discussed in prior lectures, first degree AV block does not lead to bradycardia. When it comes to second degree AV block, type 1, also called winky back, usually does not need treatment. Usually this is more of a vagal um, condition, uh, more during sleep, can sometimes occur during the day, but when the person becomes more active or starts exerting themselves, the, they conduct better and are not very are not symptomatic. There are, however, cases of symptomatic uh, type 1 second degree AV block that do need pacing, but usually they don't need treatment. Mobitz 2, so type 2 second degree AV block and third degree AV block both need treatment. They are usually symptomatic and can progress. Mobitz 2 can progress to complete heart block and complete heart block may lead to syncope or death, and thus both of them do require treatment. Of course, for whatever cause of bradycardia, we always reverse any offending agents. So if there's any medications that would cause bradycardia, we would stop those and reassess prior to pursuing further intervention. Uh, if there's any metabolic abnormalities like extreme thyroid disorder or um, ex an extreme electrolyte abnormality of any sorts, we would want to address that beforehand. And in the absence of any reversible abnormality, if indicated, a person a permanent pacemaker can be placed. A permanent pacemaker is a generator connected to the heart via leads that can pace the heart at a minimum rate and prevent the heart rate from going too slow again. Usually it's placed in the subcutaneous tissue uh, just above the pectoralis muscle um, in the left uh, pectoral area and leads are advanced through the axillary and subclavian veins down the SVC into the right atrium and the right ventricle. Here's an example of a pacemaker on a chest x-ray. As you can see, the pacemaker is placed in the left upper chest with the leads going through the vein, down the SVC, and this lead goes to the right ventricle, and this lead goes to the left ventricle. Here are the Indications for pacemaker implantation as treatment of bradycardia with respect to sinus node disease, symptomatic resting bradycardia, so only if they're symptomatic, and asymptomatic bradycardia, bradycardia such as in athletes or during sleep, we don't need to treat. Symptomatic chorontropic incompetence. Chorontropic incompetence refers to people that cannot elevate their heart rate with, appropriately with exercise, meaning if the person is exercising and the heart rate does not rise to to allow them to perform the exercise in, in the absence of reversible cause like medications that would require pacing. Symptomatic pauses, including post-cardioversion pauses. Post-cardioversion pauses are pauses we see after an atrial arrhythmia such as atrial fibrillation, for example. If the atrial fibrillation terminates and there's a pause before the sinus node takes over, that's called a post-conversion pause. And that's an indication for pacing if it's symptomatic. So the main word here is symptomatic. Sinus node disease has to be symptomatic before we pursue pacing. With respect to AV nodal disease, symptomatic or asymptomatic second degree and third degree AV block is an indication for pacing. The only caveat to that is if a person is sleeping and there's periods of second degree or third degree AV block, that may not require pacing. Like I said, Bradycardia during sleep is a normal phenomenon, sometimes caused by sleep apnea, which may need to be screened for, but we don't usually pace people for nocturnal bradycardia. Regarding bifascicular block, so people with either a left bundle, a right bundle with a left anterior fascicular block, or right bundle with a left, post left posterior fascicular block, Another presentation is alternate bundle branch block. So going from left to right bundle branch block, um, we only pace bifascicular block if there is syncope when other causes of syncope have been excluded. So if a person has left bundle branch block or right bundle and left antifascicular block and develops syncope or alternating bundle branch block, then that's an indication for pacing. Otherwise, if they're asymptomatic, 
there's no uh, need to paste them. The last one here is on EP study, an HV interval is of more than 100 milliseconds in an asymptomatic patient. So one of the things we do when we do an EP study on somebody and put catheters inside the heart is measure the conduction along the AV node. And if we see a very long, what we call HV interval, meaning there's a lot of disease in the conduction system, especially under the AV node in the distal conduction system, that's an indication for pacing. So to summarize, symptomatic sinus node disease, advanced AV nodal disease, so second degree type 2 or third degree in the awake state, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic, or bifascicular block with syncope or alternating bundle branch block are all indications for inserting a pacemaker. Describe the three most common types of pacemaker. There are atrial lead-only pacemakers, ventricular lead-only pacemakers, and dual chamber pacemakers. In patients with sinus node disease only, but a normal AV node, we only need to paste the atrium. So if somebody has chronotropic incompetence or sinus pauses, but a normal AV node, we can simply paste the atrium and expect normal conduction to the ventricle. These pacemakers are rarely used these days, we tend to rely most, mostly on ventricular lead pacemakers or dual chamber pacemakers. Ventricular lead only pacemakers can be used usually when AV synchrony is not desired. So if somebody has atrial fibrillation but they're bradycardic, there's no reason to maintain AV synchrony because they don't have a normal sinus node or sinus beat. Hence, ventricular pacing alone will suffice. Dual chamber pacemakers will pace both the atrium and the ventricles, and they will maintain a normal A and V relationship. So they will maintain um, um, synchrony between the atrial contraction and the ventricular contraction. This is an example of atrial pacing. So here you see pacer spikes preceding the P wave. So there's an acer sp pacer spike followed by a P wave, and then a conducted QRS. Pacer spike followed by a P wave, and then a conducted QRS. So this is atrial-only pacing. So this could be a dual-chamber pacemaker, where the atrium is pacing, but the ventricle is not pacing because there's normal conduction. Or this could be an atrial-only pacemaker. You can't tell from this ECG. Here's an example of ventricular-only pacing. So here, the person has atrial fibrillation in the background, and you only see ventricular pacing spikes. So after every spike, there is a QRS. This, this is an example of atrial and ventricular pacing. So this is a dual chamber pacemaker with a lead in the atrium and a lead in the ventricle. And as you can see, there's a spike that paces the atrium and there's a P wave following that spike. And there's a spike that paces the ventricle. There's a QRS that follows the second spike. So this is dual chamber pacing. We'll now move on to the second portion of the lecture.